Hi. When Aristotle's work on logic is mentioned, it is likely in reference to prior analytics. It is in this section that the more brilliant aspects of logical argumentation are divulged. The story begins with a classification of how we convey information to one another, using language to string together words that then serve their own particular function. Individually, sentences come in three basic forms. A command describes a state the speaker wishes to be true, but itself is neither true nor false, though the state it requests may be true or false. It may also be true or false that the command was spoken, but this is a secondary state that just describes the conditions in which a command applies. A question expresses a desire for more information regarding a state. It is similar to a command in that it is neither true nor false, though the information it requests can be true or false, and it can be true or false that it was asked. But of itself, a question has no truth value. Questions and commands can be thought of as tools by which states are observed and controlled, but are not themselves models of states, physical or otherwise. Which introduces the third kind of sentence, the statement, an arrangement of words which can be declared true or false. Statements are models of states, physical or imaginary, conveyed by language. Statements and states are central to language. Questions ask after them, and commands attempt to create them. So it is fair to say that all three of these kinds of sentences involve states, but that statements are the only sentences which contain information about states themselves. Questions and commands are referential to information contained elsewhere. Once sentences are linked together, they create an argument which is to say, they weave together information that circumscribes a central statement and acts as the reason that statement is true. Questions have value to arguments in that they probe for a particular kind of statements that can function as reasons, but a question is not a reason in itself. Commands are perhaps less useful in arguments, though they can instruct an interlocutor as to where information can be found, or instruct them not to find it. Naturally, this leaves statements as the core fabric of argumentation. When an argument is entirely composed of statements, it can gain the property of being internally referential, which is to say, it does not have to depend on information outside of the argument for the reasons to determine the truth of the central statement, the conclusion. When an argument has this property, it is said to be valid. Thus, in spoken and written arguments, only those entirely composed of statements can be considered as valid. Aristotle conducted an analysis of these kinds of arguments, or at least of simple arguments that were composed of statements. He showed that it was not always the case that all statement arguments were valid. Validity is a kind of closed system, and for reasons surrounding a conclusion to actually apply, the information contained within the conclusive statement has to be present in the reasons, or the premises. If the information comes from somewhere else, then the system isn't closed. The conclusion isn't automatically false, but if it is true, then its reasons come from somewhere beyond the boundaries of the argument. There is an inherent problem with this open system, which is called invalidity, the purpose of reason is to separate what is physically real from imaginative fictions. Both are useful in their way, but terrible, terrible things tend to happen when one is mistaken for the other. When pulling reasons from an open system, extending it to all which exists, it is easy to mistake fiction for fact and fact for fiction. The organon proposes isolation as a means to create distinctions, and in this case it is most effective. But it is also important to keep in mind that if the system were truly closed, it would have little value. The statements presented as true premises themselves derive their truth from the states upon which they are modeled, and these states lie outside of a spoken argument. Statements in ancient Greece were tested for truth by two methods. The first method was demonstration, 
a precursor to scientific inquiry in which a statement is given as a hypothesis and then evidence is presented from the physical world to show that the state it describes is real. This was a primitive methodology which would later posit vital flaws, after which science began to focus on presenting counterexamples as evidence contrary to a given argument, and a statement's truth would be measured by the scientist's failure in this pursuit. Demonstration takes the essential step of going outside of spoken argument in order to determine truth. Some folks don't really gel with this approach, because it means the initial arguments used to give us our very first true statements were themselves invalid as spoken arguments. Language is itself based on physical inductions and demonstrations, and there is really no way to be 100% certain the things our senses tell us are accurate just certain beyond reasonable levels of doubt. The second method, aside demonstration, was debate, which is to have a collective of observers examining the same statement and attempt to persuade one another of its truth or falsity through reasoned argumentation. However, in ancient Greece, logic being something of a fledgling art, the definition of reasoned argumentation has to come under some scrutiny. One of the primary means of debate was to choose reasons by their rhetorical value, to say things in such a beautiful way that it swayed the passions of the collective toward faith in the statement as a form above reproach. In other words, the notions of beauty and ugliness were used to determine a statement's truth value. With rhetoric, it was not necessary to engage the rational faculty of the collective. So long as all believed in the same truth, there could be harmony. Because of this division of methods between purely spoken argument and argument grounded on external observations, the philosophers of Greece were split into at least two opposing camps. There were those who determined the truth by the eye, by what they saw, and those who determined it by ear, by what they were told. And this division of means had serious ramifications. Greece was held roughly between opposed political ideologies, tyranny, which gave some men the power to have their spoken words determine the truth, and democracy, which attempted to dilute this power by ensuring that what was spoken rested on the observational consensus of every citizen. The outcome of both methods had their flaws. Tyranny led to controlled chaos and war, Democracy struggled as ever to have its citizens learn enough of the physical world to make sensible decisions. If these two disciplines could somehow be united, if all that were spoken in language could be declared demonstrably true just by the way that it was said, the division between the philosophical schools could be ended, and their consequence, good governance, could help the cities of Greece proceed together toward enlightenment. This hope was cast forward as the syllogism, an argument composed of three requisite statements combined in a very special way. Two statements would be premises, statements which, if true, would automatically necessitate the truth of another requisite statement. But if either of the premises were false, a syllogism would not allow for the conclusive statement to be true. Logic, as a language, is best described as truth-neutral. It requires that one acknowledges the fewest possible axioms from outside of the system in order to establish syllogisms and other more complex argumentative forms. Outside of its axioms, it is impartial as to whether any statement is true or false, and whether it is declared so by way of observation or just arbitrary declaration before it is input as a variable in an argumentative structure. It restricts its concern merely to the declaration of whether that argumentative structure itself is valid. That is to say, if every single time statements declared true are its premises, the conclusive result is also the truth. The validity of a syllogism can only be challenged by presenting a counterexample, an instance where the premises are all true but the conclusion is false, which shows that the information in the conclusion is derived from elsewhere and that's largely what prior analytics contains. Dozens of statements connecting terms with the relations all, some, and no, of which many are explained to be invalid, and 24 emerge as usable arguments. On the surface, this may seem a very small principle to guide all of dialectic, 
For how often do I ever come across knowledge I know is above reproach, premises with which to find a conclusion? On a deeper level I must return to the fact that all parts of the syllogism are statements which have only been assigned the rôle of premises and conclusions within the context of a particular argument. But once that argument is validated by logic, the tested conclusion, now known to be a true statement, can cease to be regarded as a conclusion, and instead be used as a true premise to an entirely different argument. The more statements I test by valid argument, the higher I can rise through a hierarchy of known truths, where each ascension rests firmly on the ground of the argument preceding it. In this way, one can maximize the amount of information made available from accepting an iota of demonstrative truth, and not heedlessly draw conclusions from uncertain perceptions. This was the harmony put forward by the Organon, that if we are to build more than a house of cards threatening collapse by the loss of its rhetorician's abstractions, a sense of order may yet survive by being grounded in an external, immutable law. This is not the fusion of one supreme human tyrant and an equal collective humanity as diplomatic tyrants working together. It is an understanding that such human tyranny is in pale imitation of the dictations of physicality, and that any order imposed by a human is ultimately subject to the demands of the tyrant nature. We can interpret its edicts once we know them, we can twist the law to our advantage, but each of us is also subject to its truth.